So those are the four <laughs> interpretations of the brambles that we have so far. We haven't finished the first interpretation yet, right? Um, but <coughs> it's already giving us this sort of general rule, right? Uh, where he's got this idea that language develops from a particular image to a general one. And he gives this example uh, of, the, um, um, of the caduceus. Um, and this is, this is a caduceus, which is a, a symbol uh, that uh, was carried by the god Hermes um, in Greek mythology. And he writes, this was the birth of the fable a kind of speech which corresponds in all respects to writing by hieroglyphics. So, so now he's giving us a comparison between the fable and hieroglyphics. So, in, um, all right, um, each being the symbol of something else understood. So, so both the fable and the hieroglyphic is a symbol of something else, okay? Uh, so the fable is, you know, it's telling us a story about the brambles, but it's actually symbolizing the story about people choosing a king, right? And here, as it, and as it sometimes happened, when a hieroglyphic became famous, it lost its particular signification and assumed a general one as the caduceus, which was at first painted only to denote the Pacific office of Hermes, so always painted with Hermes, right, became in time to be the common symbol of leagues and amity. Right? So it then becomes this general symbol of you know, friendship, of, of people allying themselves with each other. Right? But you know, it starts out as a, as, a, as a particular symbol that's just really just symbolizing Hermes, right? And then it becomes this general symbol of League's Amity. It's, it, it, and in the same way, the hieroglyphic starts as this sort of very specific uh, particular symbol only des designating one particular thing and then becomes a more general symbol um, that, uh, th that designates a universal. Right? So he's, he's talking about this movement from particular signification to a general signification, and he also says that the fable uh, participates in that kind of movement. Right? And so the next part of his, um, uh, of his um, text talks about how fable then transforms itself into something else. Right? Um, so how does he do that? Um, he says that the fable, or the apologue, turns into a proverb. Right? Like the move from the hieroglyphic to the symbol, the apologue becomes a proverb after repeated use. Right? So you use it enough, all of a sudden it becomes more and more general. Right? Um, so let's take a look at this. So he's, he, you know, he gave us that fable of the brambles, the trees and the brambles. Then he shows how this fable transforms itself later on into a proverb. Okay, let's, uh, I'll just read this through. So it was with the apologue, of which when any one became celebrated for the art and beauty of its composition or for some extraordinary efficacy in its application, it was soon converted and worn into a proverb. Right? We have a fine instance of this in the message of uh, Je Jehoash to Amaziah, saying, uh, the thistle that was in Lebanon sent to the cedar that was in Lebanon, sent to the cedar, oh, that was in, sorry, saying, give thy daughter to my son to wife and there passed by a wild beast that was in Lebanon and trod down the thistle. So um, you notice that it's, you know, in the, so in the, in, the, in the story here of the trees and the brambles, one of the, one of the things was important was the cedars of Lebanon, right? So the cedars of Lebanon compared to uh, the brambles, the cedars of Lebanon are much more magnificent and powerful than the brambles. And here, there's a reference to that same story, right? We're talking about that thistle I mean, which here is, is another word for the, for the brambles in Lebanon, was, you know, um, you know, sent this message to the cedar, says, oh, you know, give me your daughter to be my son's wife, right? And then, um, you know, again, it's the same sort of thing where the thistles, they don't have any right to be um, asking for the, the daughter of the cedars who are so great and magnificent and those, those lowly thistles, they would never be able to like, match them in, in order to, to marry somebody in that, in that family, right? So there was, and they're passed by a wild beast that was in Lebanon and trod down the thistle. So it's like kind of, you know, you, you try and pretend that you're so great, all that's going to happen is somebody's going to come and trot, you know, trod you down and, you know, it's a, it's, it's, it's a bad way to, 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 con to conduct your affairs or something like that. But anyway, but what's clear here is that this passage is referring to the story as a story that everybody already knows. It's being used not as a story, but as a proverb. Nobody, they don't have to tell the story anymore because everybody knows the story and therefore they can use it as a proverb. Right? And so 
So, so obviously, or, you know, what, what he's concluding, right, that this satiric apologue of the Sicil and Caesar, Caesar has now become a proverb, right? That, that, the, that there's a, a transformation. Once you use the apologue enough, it turns into a proverb. And that's this movement from a specific story for a specific situation into a, a kind of image that becomes more and more general and that can be used more universally. Right? Um, and the warrant, which he doesn't really give here, is, has to explain this movement. How, would the, how, is this, how does this movement happen? Well, I, we, we kind of got an explanation that, that there's this, there's this um, habitual use that, that creates this transformation. Right? Uh, but he doesn't kind of lay it out so clearly right in this passage. Right? Um, so that's th th the... But I guess that's the, the next step in his argument, right? Um, finally, he, 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 there's a, I guess there's a final step where he says that once, once the proverb comes into use, that proverb later turns into a speech that uses simile and metaphor, right? And so the simile is the first example, and he has this um, quote that he finds, the Lord called thy name a green olive tree, fair and of goodly fruit, with the noise of a great tumult, he hath kindled fire upon it, and the branches of it are broken. Um, so again, it's referring to this, this olive tree as being great, right? And here, he's saying, the, the Lord called thy name a green olive tree. So the name is like an olive tree, right? So he's calling this person um, uh, a, a, an olive tree. And so that's the simile. That's the, he's comparing the person to an olive tree, and he's, he's clearly sort of, he's pointing to that, that comparison. Right? And so that's what a simile is. You compare using like or as. That's kind of the definition of a simile. Um, and essentially, it's, it's when, you're, when, you, when you name these two things and you say, these are two things that I'm comparing to each other. Right? And, and, it's, and he's doing it based upon the proverb. Because it's essentially, we're going back to this proverb of the, sort of the, the big great tree um, and the small brambles and, and the relationship between the two, the, the big tree being magnificent, the small br brambles being lowly. Right? And, and, and the Lord here calling this person a, gre uh, a green olive tree, um, but then sort of, um, you know, kindling fire upon the tree and the branches of it are broken. So there's, there's some sense in which um, by calling somebody, the Lord calling that person the olive tree is sort of the prelude to, to, to bring this person down, right? Um, that's the simile. Similarly, he has um, an example of how this works as a metaphor, right? So we've got, uh, here, man is a tree in the metaphor. So therefore, thus saith the Lord God, because thou hast lifted up thyself in height, and he hath shot up his top amongst the thick boughs. So he's speaking to this person, but speaking to the person as if this person was a tree. Right? There's not, he's not actually saying, you are like a tree. He's just speaking to him, you are a tree. Right? Um, he hath shot up his top amongst the thick boughs, and his heart is lifted up in his height. Right? So, so here, it's, a, it's, it's use of that same proverb and using it as a metaphor when you, you'd actually, you're just, you're just assuming he is the tree, right? And he goes through and, you know, he talks about how this tree gets, gets cut down and then the balls are broken and everybody tramples on the boughs. Um, and so this is, a, you know, another kind of a story about how um, you, shouldn't, um, you shouldn't claim you're, you're too high, right? To the end that none of all the trees by the waters exalt themselves for their height. You shouldn't exalt themselves for your height, neither shoot up their top amongst the boughs, because if you do that, you're going to get um, cast down by, by God, right? So again, you know, what, what he's doing is he's laying out this, this movement, you know, starting with that fable, um, we had of the, the trees and the brambles, moving to the proverb, the proverbial use, and now to the simile use, and now to the, to the metaphorical use. And he sees that as kind of the movement of language, right? So um, we can only understand the metaphor, though, because we've got accustomed to this story through the prior uses, right? So that, 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 um, that, that movement is a movement in which you become more and more familiar uh, with the kind of structure that, that we're looking at. So you remember that from last time as well, you know, this, this, uh, this use and custom is really key um, for the development of understanding in language. All right?